The podcast you're listening to is part of the Second Union Podcast Network. You can listen, like, and subscribe to all our podcasts by heading over to wearesecondunion.com. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to The Experts, your exceptional guides to all things X-Men. I am Jeremy. I'm Joanna. And I am Jesse. We are doing this show in conjunction with Second Union. For more of the latest headlines in entertainment, please go to our website at wearesecondunion.com. Oh, in this era of uh, no comic books, I gotta admit, um, staying home is much more dull. (laughs) True. I am used to... that's what hobbies are for. Yeah, but comic books are my hobby. Oh, yeah. Time to diversify. Yeah, I may have to start gaming again. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> to each their own. Yeah, I'm still processing some of the latest developments when it came out of uh, X Men comics. Before everything was suspended, uh, we have found out that yes, Kitty Pride cannot be resurrected on Krakoa for the current period. Mm-hmm. And I was talking with someone about her unique situation, why it seems like uh, Krakoa and portals will not work for her, and uh, she also cannot phase through Krakoa and vines which is how she was drowned by Sebastian Shaw. And I was discussing it with a friend. We may have accidentally stumbled upon the reason why this cannot work. Oh, really? What you got? Okay, so run this through. We've got an island full of mutants, both good and evil. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the only mutant who doesn't have free reign on the island right now is Kitty. Or, I'm sorry, Mm -hmm. Kate Pride. Kate, yeah. It seems to completely negate her ability. She can't use the portals. She cannot phase through objects of Krakoa. So Krakow is pretty much a locked door to her, both uh, both as far as travel and physically. Mm-hmm. Whatever's happening is preventing her from being able to just walk through Krakow like everything else. So who would find a reason to prevent her from doing that? And the only answer I could come up with as I was thinking out loud with this person was Moira McTaggart. I was just thinking that right mm. now. That's the only thing that makes sense here. Same reason why she doesn't want precogs on the island. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't want to be found because whatever she has in in mind for her species, mutants, is not completed yet. Um, I, I know the prevailing theory is it has something to do with Emma, and the further the Marauders goes along, it seems less and less likely. Uh, especially it's since it's been... It could ver- be a vendetta of some sort. I know. It just it doesn't feel like... Emma would more or less charm you to your face and then lead you into the Primrose Path just bef- and spring the trap just before she admits... She's trapped you. Mm. She needs you to know she's done it. And there's nothing indicating doing that, especially since it's been very clear that Kitty was far from the from the first choice to lead the Marauders. Mm-hmm. Um, Sebastian Shaw, he, he he's using things to his advantage, but he doesn't have the pull on Krakoa to stop Kitty, or I keep wanting to use the word Kitty, Kate, from walking around like she ought to. Mm. Uh, Professor X, as much as I don't think he's doing everything ethically right now, what purpose is there, is there in this? I mean, when yeah. has he ever been completely? Yeah, and and I mean, Magneto, oddly enough, he'd be less likely than Professor X to do something like this. Yeah, yeah really. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> he's the trustworthy one? Where are we? Alternate timeline? <sighs> no, we've covered that. So, yeah, Moira is the only one I can figure to have done it. And if she has done it, I doubt she did it while letting everyone know that she did it. Moira is definitely one of those people who would rather ask for forgiveness than permission. My question is how, though? She's a she's an intelligent geneticist. And if she's been there since they were... that doesn't explain everything. Well, I was going to say, if she's been there since the, uh, since the island of Krakoa, or the, uh, the idea of Krakoa as a nation was forming, she had more than enough time to ferment a way to create this situation. But why take it out on Kate? Well, it's not a matter of taking it out on her. It's, yeah, it's not a matter of taking it out on her. It's just a matter of keeping people out of her secrets, whatever those are. She put so up walking secure... through locked doors. Exactly. Somebody that could yeah. breach any portal on the island is a big threat to discovering Moira on the underside of this island. And that's, that's fair. If there's anything we learned in the Dawn of X is that Moira keeps secrets. Like a champ. She does not let people in unless she wants them to be there. And you got to believe mm-hmm. that somebody who could walk through any other barrier and accidentally end up there is a big threat to her keeping that secret. That's totally plausible. 
Mm-hmm. So, I, do I believe it was malicious? No. I just believe she was throwing up a barrier and it had unintended consequences. Mm. <clears throat> uh, meanwhile, before comic books were suspended, the first issue of The Hellions came out. I've been so curious about this series since it was first announced. I have wanted to know what is going on here, and I finally have most of the reasons why the mutants on this team are on this team. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it basically bounces around to two major concepts. One, this is a chance for, air quotes, undesirable mutants to exercise their abilities without uh, creating an incident. Mm -hmm. Two, it's basically because these mutants' powers may affect <clears throat> who they are and how they interact with people. Um, a good example would be Scalp Hunter. He was sitting in an island on a, in a beach chair on the edge of Krakoa, just kind of creating things out of those weird modules that are sitting on his uh, on his costume, right? Mm -hmm. He got attacked by Morlocks. Um. Yeah, you can understand why Morlocks have a very personal beef with Scalp Hunter. Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, a lot of the ones that were attacking him were people that were resurrected after he killed them in the Mutant Massacre. So, yeah, uh, you need some place to keep him. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Nanny and the Orphan Maker are not getting along with really anybody other than each other. The Orphan Maker is just adamant that he has to be around Nanny at all times. He is still a child in expanded in an exo frame, more or less. I still don't know what his mutant abilities are. Meanwhile, the uh, <laughs> the Nanny is still creepy as heck. As a matter of fact, the, mm -hmm. I, I don't think Sinister likes her because he ha she has an unnatural amount of control over the Orphan Maker. And I think that kind of mm -hmm. interferes with his own need to control things. Um, Wild Child? Did you know for a while Wild Child was a perfectly upstanding superhero known as Weapon Omega? No. No, we no. sorry, Weapon Alpha. He took medication yeah. during a stint on Alpha Flight that normalized his thought process. No feral instincts at all. Mm -hmm. And he became an Alpha Flight leader during this period. So now that he's resurrected on Krakoa after being killed by Sabretooth, or as we found out in our review of Omega Red, uh, the New Mutants have been giving him that medication again. Hmm. Uh, actually, I believe it was specifically Mirage being assisted by uh, Dr. Cecilia Reyes, the one who can create force fields. Mm -hmm. Except when they got into a wild child cell, he was just kind of laying in his bed, and Cecilia didn't remember that this medication created lethargy. And as they were looking around, um, Mirage found a freshly dug up patch of dirt in wild child's chamber. Mm. He'd been putting all of his meds in the hole. Oh. oh. And he jumped up and attacked Cecilia Reyes. He'd been lying in wait. Ooh. So, more or less, the large problem for a lot of these mutants is that the Quiet Council argued amongst themselves over what to do with these mutants. They're not acting desirably, except they've kind of run into a wall with their own rules. The problem is, especially in the case of people like Scalp Hunter and Wild Child, it's not entirely that they're murderous per se, but their mutations are causing murderous impulses. And mm -hmm. if you start suppressing their powers, since powers are so central to a mutant's identity, are you therefore suppressing the mutant? Hmm. Which was an ethical question I was not prepared for. Right. So that's why Sinister came up with this idea to use all these undesirable mutants on a team that is basically meant to create spectacles of damage. Shock and awe. If you want a mission with maximum damage and minimum casualties, you send in these people. Gives them a chance to exercise their abilities. Meanwhile, they're under the control of Mr. Sinister, because this is his idea. Of course. Except this team also includes Havoc, because Havoc recently had a tirade against some non-anti-mutant uh, supremacists. Mm -hmm. He apparently lost his mind and nearly melted three people. Oh, no. Yeah, one thing that a lot of people may not realize about Havoc is that his mind is not entirely his own. He's been sharing space with a counter-dimensional version of himself that was a marauding psychopath. Yeah. And this personality from this alternative Havoc has popped up every now and again, but it usually gets suppressed within a few issues. Unfortunately, it seems like under duress now it's starting to crop back up. 
Think like a less symbiotic version of the time that Carol Danvers would pop out of Rogue's body every now and again. Mm. That's <laughs> what we're dealing with. And uh, Havoc was actually willing to go into stasis until Sinister proposed this team, which, because of Cyclops' prost uh, protests, Havoc was also put on this team instead of into stasis. The only person that is on this team by choice is Psylocke. Hmm. Quanon, who's now in control of her own body. She is the field leader of the Hellions. Huh. She is the one that has to keep them all in control. Not Havoc, her. And I know we've seen her recently, and she seems to be in moderate control of her own impulses. However, you're asking an assassin to control mutant socio and psychopaths. Yeah, moderate control is not something that I would want um, to be described in that scenario. I would want absolute. So do I. <laughs> I mean, Quanon's a smart character from everything I can gather, and she's just starting to get faculties of her own body back. She's taken all the purple out of her hair and replaced it with black. Mm -hmm. Which is her natural color, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I... Man... There's part of me that just wishes they would come up with a different name for Quana. She doesn't have to be Psylocke, but she deserves something better than the cast-offs of the last person who inhabited her body. Yeah, for sure. You know, I just can't say for sure what that is. But this team is already on shaky footing, if anything, because Sinister is the one who gets to call the missions. Mm -hmm. And their first mission is to find out why... Oh, gosh. They're trying to find out why somebody has tripped alarms at Mr. Sinister's former base in Nebraska. Hmm. The orphanage he used to run, the one where Cyclops was actually uh, fostered out of? Mm -hmm. I thought he was in... Well, you said Alaska? Or no, Nebraska? Nebraska. I thought Scott was in Alaska. No. Uh, Scott retired to Alaska when he quit being an X-Man after the Dark Phoenix saga. Mm -hmm. Scott was adopted out of Nebraska at the Essex hmm. home for Wayward Boys. Mm -hmm. Something has tripped alarms down there, and Sinister remembers he kept a lab under there, because of course he did. He's Mr. Sinister. Of yes. course. The problem That's is, the, the people in that lab are the Marauders. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. They're being hung upside down. Oh, uh-oh. Someone uh -oh. is playing around, making one of them, like, harpoon. They force them conscious, open their eyes, then somehow made their mouth, like, seal shut, waited until they could barely breathe, and then reopened it. What? Yeah, I was trying to figure out how this works, because whoever did it, as soon as he could breathe again, forced him back into slumber. Then they pulled away, and this is why I'm so ticked that comic books are suspended right now. The person doing this is named Madeline Pryor. Oh, no. Ooh. No. Pump the brakes, because this is not the Jean Grey Madeline Pryor. Uh -huh. She's wearing the robes of the Goblin Queen. Oh. She somehow has her mystic abilities back. And she's it's playing with the toys that Sinister left behind. Oh, that's dangerous. Yeah, but this gets even worse, because before she died, while she was the Goblin Queen in the Inferno event, her boyfriend at the time was one Alex Summers. Of course. Oh, wonderful. Who's going through his own problems right now with his counter-dimensional self retaking control mm -hmm. of his body. This is going to get so messy. I was just thinking that. What a mess. Yeah. yeah. Thank goodness Cyclops has nothing to do with this team right now. Seriously, he uh -oh. might make it worse. Oh. I don't see how you can make it better, because uh, a Jean Grey level telepath with enhanced mystic abilities. Mm, no thank you. Yeah, seriously. And that's, and that's this is where I have to wait until comic books are back. I'm so cheesed. Hmm. Uh, but meanwhile, at the protestations of other people, the subject of this week for the experts is Remy Etienne Lebeau, known in the comic books as Gambit. Yay! He first appeared in July of 1990 in the Uncanny X-Men Annual number 14, and then his, uh, his first full comic book was in August of 1990, Uncanny X-Men number 266. Uh, he's credited with creation by Chris Claremont and Jim Lee. However, the first panels were not drawn by Lee. He was first drawn by Mike Collins. Hmm. And uh, Gambit is... Oh, strap in. This is going to take a while. 
Okay, I've got my monster. Let's go. Okay, so in the early life, Remy LeBeau was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. He was uh-huh. kidnapped from the hospital where he was born. And I say born in air quotes because there was a uh, there was a volume called X-Men The End that was supposed to tell the supposed future end of the X-Men where we found out that Gambit's body was actually a, a scientific experiment by Mr. Sinister to create a powerful clone body that he could dump his intelligence into and escape control from his patron, Apocalypse. But when Apocalypse found out about this baby, instead of destroying it, he decided to taunt Sinister by just kind of sending it away. Hmm. He's not going to take away all of his hope, but he's going to take away enough of it where it drives him a little bit crazier. <laughs> crazier. Yeah. Anyway, the uh, the child was taken from the hospital it was at, and it was raised by the Thieves Guild and the LeBeau clan. you got to remember, this was a baby. It didn't have a name at the time. Right. Uh, it was then given to something called the Antiquary as a tribute. Uh, the mm. Thieves Guild kept referring to this child as Le Diable Blanc. The White Devil? Yes. I'm a little offended by this title. Well, okay. this child was prophesied to unite the Thieves Guild and the Assassin's Guild. Mm. Uh, from there, the child was given a name, Remy LeBeau, and was placed in the care of someone called Fagin and his mob. They were street thieves who taught the child everything it, f- it, it knew about early thievery. Mm-hmm. Uh, Remy was living as an orphan on the streets, and at the age of 10, he attempted to pick a pocket of a Mr. Jean-Luc Lebeau. When you're trying okay. to pick a pocket, you should not do that to the man who is running the thieves' guild. No, probably <laughs> not. However, the man was charmed by the boy who took him off the streets and adopted him into the family. Now, somewhere in his teens is when Remy's biokinetic charge abilities kicked in. If you're relatively new to the idea of Gambit and wonder why he always carries a deck of cards, it's because they're a simple weapon. He can carry 52 of them in a box. That's, you know, like two full clips, if you're putting that in terms of automatic weapons. That's more than two full clips, but okay. But he charges it up. He can use his abilities to charge anything he touches with kinetic energy. Uh, think of it as exciting the molecules. They start ramming into each other hard enough they can explode. Like microwaving? Um, no. Microwaving would the excite out. just water molecules. You're char- when you're charging something up with kinetic energy, it's like you're overcharging the, uh, the protons and electrons in it. So everything is super excited and very combustible. Like energy drink. Yeah, so you're not just cooking <laughs> it. You're turning it into very touchy, uh, a very touchy explosive. Yeah. Uh, he did keep his power secret for the most part. He would practice him away from the Thieves' Guild. I wonder why you wouldn't trust thieves. I don't know. There's no honor among thieves, apparently. Uh, when he was 15, he accompanied his adopted cousin, Etienne Marceau, to the tithing. It's a ritual test to uh, cause initiation into the Thieves' Guild. It did not go well because they were supposed to steal from a mutant known as Kandra, who is an immortal. Hmm. Kandra recognized Remy from an encounter that took place in what is her past, but is his future. See, Kandra's a time traveler. Oh, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. Yes. Well, I'm sorry, Kandra's not a time traveler. It turns out an adult Remy LeBeau would have a time traveling adventure that took him back to the 19th century, and being an immortal, Kandra's still alive. Oh. Ah. So she knew who this boy was. She kidnapped Remy. And sold him to a mutant gangster and child slave trader. The guy was known as the Pig. Oh, wonderful. Aptly named. Yeah, but the Pig planned to take these mutant children and sell them to Hydra. Oh, no. The idea was to create child soldiers out of powerful people. Uh, that Remy ha- always worked so well. Yeah, but Remy had enough command of his abilities to be able to escape the holding pen. But the Pig caught up with him and the other escapees. And that's when Remy discovered what his abilities could do, because during the, uh, the attempted escape, he picked up a playing card that Etienne had dropped, charged it, and threw it in the pig's face, taking out the pig's eye. Hey. This is where Gambit discovered the usefulness of playing cards combined with his powers. They're so tossable if you get the right little oomph with your wrist and your finger together. like. Yeah, the pig wasn't killed, though. He continued to chase them. The, the kids actually jumped off a cliff. Remy survived the jump. Unfortunately, Etienne did not. Mm. Uh, after that, 
Gambit was hired, or I should say young Remy, was hired by a certain geneticist known as Mr. Sinister, uh -huh. who at this time was using his human face of Nathaniel Essex. And the Essex wanted something that the Weapon X program stole from him. And I find it very curious. To, I, I didn't know that Sinister had any connections to the Weapon X program, let alone Me that they took something either. from him. Although being him being a geneticist can make some sense he had some part in it. Uh, well, he didn't have an active part. See, the thing that he wanted Remy to steal back from the Weapon X program was his diaries. Dear diary, today the girl didn't sit with me at lunch. I'm pretty sure it's more uh, more <laughs> nefarious than that. But the Thieves Guild accepted the mission and sent Remy on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, while he was scouting the, rep the Weapon X facility, Remy couldn't really stand the cold, and he swore he was going to steal himself a long, stylish jacket in New Orleans mm -hmm. after this mission. Hint, hint. I know. Yeah. That's why he went, he... Yeah. And, of course, he would eventually do that. But as Remy was entering the Weapon X facility, he witnessed something else that he, he never really forgot, evidently. Mm -hmm. There was this psychotic hairy man who ran by him. <laughs> Sabertooth? Nope. Weapon X created only one weapon. Oh, that one. Yeah, yes. that psychotic hairy man. Apparently, he ran across Logan not long after the adamantium bonding process. Uh, Remy found the diaries however he himself deemed them too dangerous for Essex to have mm -hmm. so Remy didn't fully trust him and therefore he burned the diaries good on him yeah it's kind of odd that uh, Sinister got this close to his potential body and didn't recognize it but uh, he did disappoint both the Thieves Guild and Essex by air quotes failing to return the diaries uh, not long after this, Remy, uh, into his adulthood, married Belladonna Bordeaux, one of the higher members of the Assassin's Guild. And it looked like he was going to succeed in melding the two guilds into one organization. Unfortunately, he was challenged by Belladonna's brother to a duel after the wedding, and in the duel, Gambit succeeded in killing his bride's brother. Well, that puts a damper on the honeymoon. Yeah, after that, he was exiled from the city. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So after his exile, uh, Gambit was kind of trolling the uh, area of New Orleans, trying to just wander the world and find his place. He mm -hmm. became a professional master thief, made a lot of contacts. A few people wanted him dead, which kind of happens when you're a master thief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Gambit found he had a near uncontrollable amount of energy flowing through him. He, he actually was having trouble controlling his own abilities. Gambit did go to the one person he knew of to help him, Mr. Sinister. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sinister modified Gambit's powers by removing a portion of Gambit's own brainstem. Say so what? Uh, apparently the brainstem is the center of where Gambit's powers emanate from, and by reducing the, power, the size of the stem, Gambit's powers were actually uh, coming down to a controllable level again. Mm -hmm. But he still had a very large amount of explosive ability still within him. There's some comic book logic right there. Well, right. years later in a subsequent adventure... Sinister, uh, a, a younger version of Sinister, actually returned that section of Gambit's brainstem. That's silly. This is it's part. Just you wouldn't have lived that long. This is another part of when Gambit time traveled to the 19th century. Uh, yeah. Comic book logic. The younger Sinister restored it, not the older one. Uh huh. Uh, anyway, Sinister wanted the favor of bringing Gambit's powers under control. So Gambit carried out a group of missions for him. He basically became a, uh, not an errand boy, but just his guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Gambit also gathered together a group of mercenaries, which Sinister named the Marauders. Aww. Uh, Sinister also gave Gambit orders to lead Sabretooth, Blockbuster, Prism, and Riptide into the tunnels under New York City. And uh, Gambit did not know that there was a second group of mercenaries, Scalp Hunter, Arclight, Harpoon, Malice, Scrambler, and Vertigo, sent into the tunnels. Hmm. Uh, Scalp Hunter's group followed a Morlock named Tommy, and the goal was to wipe out all Morlocks. Gambit is indirectly responsible for the mutant massacre. Yikes. Uh, although Gambit was able to save a child. One child. That child's name was Sarah, <laughs> and believe it or not, that child would become an X-Man. Who? Which one, yeah. How many X-Men do you know that were Morlocks? None by the name of Sarah? 
that I can think of. Well, of course, her name on the X Men wasn't Sarah; it's Marrow. Oh. oh. Okay. You know, Marrow has her own history. She's uh, sometimes a mutant terrorist, sometimes a mutant mercenary, sometimes an anti mutant hunter. Mm hmm. But that's a story for another day. True. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as Gambit was wandering the world after the mutant massacre trying to find his own place, he ran into a teenage girl who needed help because she was trying to run away from uh, Amal Farouk, the Shadow oh. King. <laughs> um, the girl didn't seem to recognize much of anybody or anything, but Gambit knew there, was, there had to be something special about her. She was a young African girl with white hair. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, it's not what you're thinking of, though. See, Storm was presumed dead during this period. Mm. She'd been kidnapped by Nanny, who, as you know, has this real weird thing about rescuing infant and very young mutants, right? Yeah. She would sometimes right. turn them into her personal enforcers, but most of the time she was just kidnapping young mutants. Well, she kidnapped Storm, and that's not her speed. But at some point, she got her hands on technology that allowed her to de-age adult mutants. Oh. Yeah. So, this is why a teenage storm is running around with a full-grown Gambit. Mm. Okay, I was kind of wondering about that. Yeah, Gambit did manage to rescue Storm not just from the Shadow King, but from the nanny and the orphan maker who were looking for this girl. And uh, Storm didn't have her memories at this point, either. Oh. She didn't know who she was. But Gambit uh, started to teach her skills so she could stay alive, taught her how to be a thief. And eventually, based on this young girl's instincts, they ended up uh, looping back around to the X-Men. So did she know she had her powers at she, that time? They were kind of wild and a little bit unknowable. She knew she was generating winds every now and again, but the fact that she can control weather was a bit beyond her. Oh, okay. But uh, because this girl accidentally caused Gambit to hook up with the X-Men, he ended up assisting the X-Men, X-Factor, and New Mutants fight Genotians. Oh, um, for those who are listening, Genotians are human supremacists who treat mutants as a slave class. Mm -hmm. Which you would think because of their powers doesn't seem possible, but Genotians developed a, uh, a group of power inhibitors and they blanketed their island with them. Yep. You know, it, it wasn't a case where no mutant on the island could use their powers, but it ended up, uh, they had a collar system where they could selectively turn them on and off for mutants to do their slave work. Uh, the only person who had reservations about this weird new uh, about this weird cage and hanging around was the small hairy one. I don't know why Wolverine had doubts about Gambit, but he did. Uh, this he didn't like anybody. He distrusted everybody. So. Well, this actually led to a duel between the two of them in the danger room. <laughs> uh, Gambit actually cheated. He used a robotic, yeah. yeah. He used a robotic doppelganger of Lady Deathstrike to distract Wolverine. <laughs> That's still Our well sick. within his wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. But, but Wolverine was still yeah. healing from major injuries he took at the hands of the Reavers. Mm. Remember when Jubilee freed Wolverine from a crucifix? Yep. This is not long after that. Oh. Uh, Gambit and the X Men were then taken forcibly to the Shi'ar Empire by Lila Cheney. The X Men along with the Starjammers, battled Deathbird, the Imperial Guard, and a band of War Scrolls. That sounds like it should have a body count. Yeah, or a typical weekend for the X-Men. But when the X-Men finally got back to Earth, they had to deal with another problem they're well used to, and probably one even Gambit understands at this point. The Shadow King returned. Mm. And Gambit even fell under the thrall of the Shadow King for a little while. Oh, boy. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh, after this was the 90s era of the X-Men. There was 13 of them. They were separated into two teams. Gambit ended up on X-Men Blue under Cyclops' leadership. Uh, Shut up. I don't like him, and I don't have to. I know, but I don't like Gambit, and I don't have to. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Calm down. Calm down. Do. No. No, he's my favorite. He's my cinnamon bun, and and nobody can say anything bad about him. Yes, we can. Fight me. It might be the energy drink speaking, but fight me. He looks like something Michael Flatley would dance on. Wow. <laughs> You're going to diss his spiffy coat like that? Like... I'm going to diss that, the bright pink armor, the hair that looks like he used um, up half a can of product. Pink, it's magenta, okay, and he has fabulous hair. You're just jealous. No, I proudly uh, shave uh, my hair. All right, all right, all right, all right. 
You two, go back to your corners. <laughs> calm down, and let's get back to the assignment. Don't Fine, pee in the I'm ring. my energy drink. Do not pee in the ring. <laughs> that was uh, hissing. Some of the first adventures uh, Gambit had as a member of X-Men Blue was up against Magneto, the Acolytes, Fenris, the Hand, Omega Red, Sabretooth, and Mojo. And then Gambit found out he had another person that didn't like him. But this one came from the future. Himself? Lucas Bishop. Ah. Uh, as a matter of fact, Gambit was attacked by another person who didn't like him. His wife! I was going to say, he kind of racks those up, doesn't he? <laughs> not not wives, but I mean, he has a couple of those, doesn't he? I want to give a tasteless joke, but I can't. It's, it's a bit much. <laughs> Uh, Gambit finally told the X-Men about how he fled from New Orleans after killing his brother-in-law in self-defense. Mm -hmm. uh, Gambit also encountered the second Ghost Rider, Danny Ketch, battled the Brood Queen and the Brood Possessed Ghost Rider, and witnessed mm -hmm. the apparent death of his ex-wife, Belladonna. Uh, it's not long after this, Gambit started to become remote, uh, very, very interested in another X-Man. Rogue? Yes, Anna Raven. Yes, yes. He started flirting with her, despite the fact that she kept putting him off and occasionally punch him in the face. He likes that. I mean, he likes feisty women, and Rogue and Remy together are the best couple ever. I don't know about feisty women. He likes unobtainable women. And Rogue, during this period, was the definition of unobtainable. Yeah, yeah. but she's also feisty. I like her attitude. Uh, the story, according to the writers, was originally written to be a one-time flirt flirtatious thing. But evidently, uh, several writers picked it up from there and just kind of ran with the football. Yeah, because they are great together. I I don't know about that. The gauntlet has been thrown down. Fight me. This is an amazing couple. I, Man, we, haven't rung the, we have not even rung the bell for round two. Come on. Yeah, I, I can't say that for sure. I don't think the two bring out the best in each other. I didn't say they brought out the best in each other, but no relationship is perfect. Yeah, I don't think they are the best for each other either. I think they're amazing. Uh, after a long period of time, Remy had a dark secret, and Sabretooth kept hinting to it for a long time during the period where Sabretooth was an, uh, an unwilling resident of the X-Mansion. He was a prisoner who was occasionally helping out their version of X-Factor. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rogue kept asking what was going on, but Gambit would not reveal what was happening. Believe it or not, uh, Gambit was captured by Magneto and held in a mock trial. For some reason, Magneto disguised himself as Eric the Red, one of uh, Cyclops' alter egos. Mm. And Rogue was forced to kiss Gambit. And because of that kiss, she managed to peek into his mind and found the memories of Gambit forming the Marauders for Mr. Sinister. Oh, I mean, the only thing that stopped Rogue from beating him to death was that she also found the memory of saving Sarah. Mm -hmm. Gambit was cast out of the X-Men, and he was abandoned in Antarctica. That coat shirt came in handy, though. Hey, Isn't when that where the Savage Ends at? Uh, f deep in the Arctic Circle, yes, but that's not where they left him. They left him in the frozen <laughs> ways. And when Rogue gives you the cold shoulder, she means it. Like, dropped in the Arctic Circle? Yeah. Uh, Gambit eventually made his way back into Magneto's Citadel, and he felt the psionic essence of a dead mutant named Mary Purcell. Uh, Mary's essence bonded with him and allowed him to survive until he could reach the Savage Land. It was there that Remy struck a deal with something known as the New Sun. The deal meant he got passage back to America in exchange for running errands with the help of a friend named Jacob Gavin Jr. Huh. Uh, during this period, Remy's ability started to amplify. And when the absorption of Mary Purcell's psych wore off, Rogue spent months looking for him. I don't think this was romantic. I think she was worried that a potential murderer was on the loose. A little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Yeah, and uh, Gambit encounters Storm and Shadowcat, who are trying to stop him because he was trying to steal a gem for his new employer. And this is mm -hmm. not a gem anyone should own. 
Ruby Which one is it? Yeah, the Ruby Gem of Sidorak. Mm. There it is. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, the Crimson Gem of Sidorak, the thing that gives the Juggernaut his powers. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, but because of a turn of altruism, Storm and Shadowcat agree to return with Gambit to the X-Men. Mainly for his self-respect. And uh, Gambit actually became the field leader of a branch of X-Men for a little while. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, Rogue started to warm to him slowly. However, she was still worried that her powers would break him. <laughs> uh, the new son, as it turns out, was somebody Gambit already knew. It was Gambit. Mm-hmm. What? It's an alternative universe version of Gambit. I don't know how this works. Yeah. Um, after this period is when we found out more about Bishop's future. Uh, Bishop came from the future witnessing a video where Jean Grey made a call to any X-Men that were available before she was murdered. She mentioned before she died that they were betrayed by one of their own. And the only person Bishop knew to ask about this was a mysterious figure he knew as LeBeau. As soon as he arrived mm -hmm. in the current timeline, you know, the 616, he recognized LeBeau as Gambit and figures that must be the traitor. Mm -hmm. So Gambit... I'm sorry, Bishop is convinced that Gambit is a traitor, and just about every time Gambit goes on a mission, Bishop is right behind him, because, not because he wants to back him up, because he does not trust this fool, and the X-Men will not listen when he says, you need to get rid of this idiot. It's kind of fascinating when you realize that uh, the cop is uh, tailing the thief. <laughs> <laughs> um... I mean, when Ga when uh, LeBeau is in Bishop's timeline, he's known as The Witness, but there's no known reason why he was called The Witness. However, I imagine it's because people suspect he was the last person to witness the X-Men alive. Uh, after this, Storm leads a team of X-Men in search of the Destiny Diaries. Uh, the precog, known as Destiny, Irene... Uh, yeah, Irene, who, as we know, is Mystique's pseudo-wife... She spent a period where she had written down a lot of her premonitions in rambling tones in various volumes left all over the world. Uh, the 13th volume in particular is known as the Books of Truth. Gambit volunteered to find them all. Uh, Rogue, however, would not follow him because she was increasingly afraid that her powers were growing out of control and would harm people. She refused to go. So, being on his own, Gambit returned to thievery looking for the books until he was framed by a mutant businessman known as Sebastian Shaw. <laughs> no, he was framed for the death of an Australian crime lord called the Viceroy. Uh, Gambit needed the assistance of Rogue's current team of X-Men, the X-Men Extreme. And uh, between all of them, they were able to clear Gambit's name. After that, Remy was captured, and his powers were used to open a portal for an alien invasion of Earth led by an interdimensional warlord known as Khan. In, <laughs> insert Will Shatner yell here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm way ahead of you. Uh, meanwhile, another enemy of the X-Men Extreme, known as Vargas, a human and a very capable fighter, used the invasion as a chance to kill more members of the X-Men Extreme. Uh, Vargas was actually responsible for the death of Psylocke in this story. Nearly beat Beast to death, too. Oh. Uh... Rogue was often depicted in Destiny's Diaries as the one to kill Vargas. Rogue attempted to rescue and shield Gambit, but it got her stuck, and Vargas used the opportunity to impale the two of them. While Gambit was wounded, Beast's surgical sil skills got Gambit through, and uh, Rogue's, Rogue's powers at this point were going through an interesting shift where she, her body would randomly recall the abilities of different mutants she had absorbed over the years. Mm -hmm. So she managed to have survived the impaling because one of her random recalls was Wolverine. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> because also plot. Yeah. Uh, Rogue's powers also allowed her to plead with Gambit on the astral plane, who was willing to give up and die at this point. But oh. she managed to convince him to come back. But the thing was, when they came back, apparently the entire adventure was too taxing because both of them lost their mutant abilities. But this did give them the opportunity to actually be a romantic couple, so they decided to retire from the X-Men and move to California. Like you do. Yeah. Uh, even though he was powerless during this period, Gambit assisted Storm in infiltrating the, uh, the President of the United States Texan Ranch to find information on a closed group meeting about worldwide policing on mutants. I don't know what that's about. I, I guess I didn't read that. 
I don't remember that either. Uh, eventually, another mutant, Sage, managed to restart the powers of both Rogue and Gambit, and they rejoined the X-Men. They were put in a team run by Havoc. And uh, how's this for luck? On their first mission on this team, Gambit is temporarily blinded when one of his own energized cards went off in his face. That huh. seems like a plot thing. Well, Rogue did try to console Gambit during this period, but he was relatively inconsolable. He was very frustrated with being blind. You kind of need to see what you're stealing. It also didn't help that their romantic relationship was on the rocks now that Rogue's powers were, were uh, back on the... basically functioning. Uh, he actually started to lash out at Rogue during this period, usually verbally. And because of the repeated verbal abuse, Rogue took some time away from Gambit. Mm -hmm. However, Gambit started to gain a secondary mutation during this, uh, during this period. Without his vision, he found out he was able to start using his playing cards like they were tarot cards, and he could actually start to predict the future. How, oh, though? Twist. I don't know. Now, if you want to talk about random, that sounds random. Well, opening portals, too. That has nothing to do with even cards. Well, he, he did come up with an interesting workaround, though. He went back to Sage and asked her to just kind of use her enhanced ability of genetics to restart his powers again. Mm. Somehow that restart put his, uh, his body's chemistry back into whack, and it also restored his vision. Uh, that's some pseudoscience, but okay. Yeah, I agree. Because plot. Yeah, I was more than fine with him being blind, gone, forever. I I'm okay with no. that. No! Yeah! My cinnamon roll. Uh, Gambit also developed some deep insecurities about his romantic relationship with Rogue, which, reminder, he ruined. Um, he's not the only one that ruined relationships in the X-Men. No, but he managed to ruin so his own. get the Cyclops. Oh, I'm talking about how he ruined his own. He did that to himself. It's fine in the end. They they make up. Uh, he actually told Rogue at one point that she should just get together with Logan. I mean, I kind of liked her and Logan together for a little bit, too. Um, the funny thing was, because he heard this accusation, Logan kissed Rogue. <laughs> like you do. Yeah, Rogue managed to get Wolverine off of her before she, her powers caused any major damage. And uh, that's when Gamma started to actually think about what he was saying. And afterwards, he started to suffer from hallucinations. He was constantly fighting Mr. Sinister for some reason. Uh, the problem was they were encountering an enemy called Golgotha, who could cause somebody to say things they didn't intend to say. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Uh, after Golgotha is gone, back at the mansion, Gambit and Rogue moved into the same room, so they started to rebuild some of their intimacy, and began telepathic therapy with one person who should not, do who should not conduct telepathic therapy. I mean, there's Emma? a few of them that shouldn't. Yeah, Emma Frost was their therapist. Yeah, yeah that's what no, I thought. Mm -mm. No, thank you. Uh, what they discovered in the midst of telepathic therapy was that because of all their combined emotional baggage, uh, they were unable to make physical contact, even mentally. <laughs> uh, things got worse when a new student dropped into the X-Mansion known as Fox and was very into Gambit. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they discovered not long later, though, was that Mystique is Fox. Apparently, weird. Myst uh, no, 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 th that's not weird. The weird part is that Mystique wasn't necessarily trying to interfere with the relationship between Gambit and Rogue, even though she didn't like Gambit. But her plan was, because her relationship is so strained, Mystique, as Fox, can drop in and alleviate the physical tension. Uh... That's that, creepy. No. Yeah. That is creepy. Yeah. Once once Gambit discovered that this was Mystique, yes, Mystique revealed herself, talked about her intentions, and she even made it very apparent what her intentions were by transforming into Rogue and offering to be the physical bridge in their relationship. Oh, the... <laughs> That's... That no. is some That's Jerry Springer Rogue's stuff, dude. Well, unless it's consensual on Rogue's part, uh... This is one step away from having a, an appearance on a TV show talking about whether or not you the baby daddy. I'm just going to shut my trap and have some more monster instead of saying something. You know, the worst part is Gambit never entirely denied this offer. He was kind of mulling it over when Rogue discovered that Mystique was on the grounds and chased her away. 
especially Rogue and Mystique's relationship, that's that's where it becomes weird. Well, it became even worse when Rogue obviously found out Gambit was aware Mystique was on the ground without anyone's permission, and now Gambit actually had to deny that he ever slept with Mystique, which he did not, but unfortunately, he did not protest fast enough, obviously. <laughs> Good thing she can't tell lies from truth, huh? Ah, uh, she could still strangle the crap out of him if she wanted to. She probably will several times. Yeah. Um, after this, Apocalypse made one of his reappearances in comic books. Mm -hmm. And this was after M-Day. A serious amount of mutants had lost their abilities. Uh, Gambit actually offered himself to Apocalypse to be a horseman. And he was, transferred in, he was transformed into the Horseman of Death. I'm sure somewhere out there, Warren Worthington is crossing his arms just laughing at this. <laughs> Uh, Gambit didn't intend to be a horseman, though. His idea was that because of his strained relationship with Rogue over Mystique, and the fact that the X-Men still don't entirely trust him over his role in the Mutant Massacre, he wanted to join Apocalypse's ranks to be a spy. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, obviously Gambit is not very good at reading, or he would know that to transform into a horseman means not just undergoing a physical transformation, but a mental one. Yeah. Uh, however, Gambit managed to retain just enough of, enough of himself to declare himself both Death and Gambit, and managed to separate both himself and a newly transformed Sunfire from, from Apocalypse. Hmm. Sunfire had had a rough time up until this point. His, uh, his abilities were intact, however, he lost his legs in an attack. Hmm. And he was having serious problems with himself as an identity. As a matter of fact, he... He demanded that Rogue kiss him on the forehead and hold it there until she took his powers. If he wasn't going to be able to make use of them, someone should. Interesting. And not long after this was when he was transformed into another one of Apocalypse's horsemen, but thankfully, he got out of that as well. Uh, Sunfire actually left with Gambit after this. They did not rejoin the X-Men, uh, but they both wanted to find ways to clear Apocalypse's brainwashing from their enhanced bodies. Unfortunately, it didn't last long because, of course, two mentally compromised people should not be left on their own when they're suddenly paid a call by Mr. Sinister. Yeah. Uh, after this, Gambit reappeared around the X-Men, evidently without the abilities that he gained as death. However, he reemerged as a marauder. Mm -hmm. He was on a mission for Sinister looking for uh, knowledge of the future. And both Gambit and Sunfire encountered Cable, the time-traveling mutant, on the island of Providence. And uh, Gambit wanted to ask Cable for use of a supercomputer to answer a question referring to the phrase, one, mu one minute before dawn. Evidently, that phrase led Gambit and Sunfire directly into the Messiah Complex storyline. Mm -hmm. The Messiah Complex is kind of an important story in X-Men lore, because... The uh, This was about the first mutant child born in the M-Day era. There were supposed to be no more additional mutants. and uh, Mutants couldn't even be born because of what the Scarlet Witch did. Right. But one appeared, and the birth was so violent, the birth created an explosion that destroyed the hospital. Oh. Um, this caused Gambit to... Or Cable noted that Gambit's accent sounded forced for either comic effect or maybe to indicate that things may not be quite normal for Gambit. Mm -hmm. uh, after this, Gambit returned to Sinister Space to figure out the next step of the plan, and he reprimanded Mystique for shooting Rogue when they abducted her. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sinister assured that Rogue was still needed and would survive. Uh, Gambit even seemed to uh, sympathize a bit with Cannonball during a fight between himself and Cannonball and Iceman. <laughs> Uh, Gambit also interrupted Scalp Hunter when he was about to kill Cannonball by attacking Cannonball directly and saving him from death. Uh, Gambit also destroyed Destiny's diaries, preventing Sinister and the Marauders from getting their hands on them. Now, during the Messiah Complex storyline, obviously the X-Men are aware that the Marauders exist and Gambit's one of them. Mm -hmm. This especially pissed off an X-Man known as Wolverine. Yep. He led a group of X-Men on an assault directly on Sinister's Antarctic base. 
and uh, Gambit actually ended up tortured by Wolverine. Ooh. And that's when they found out that Cable had the baby they were all looking for in the Messiah Complex. And if you're wondering why the X-Men are so gung-ho, it's not just because this is a mutant. This is a baby, red-headed girl, whose, evident, whose birth was heralded by fire. Oh, that's... Oh, mm-hmm. boy. I think you could mm-hmm. guess who they all thought they might be dealing with. Yeah. So, uh, Gambit reveals that Cable has this baby... And drives the X-Men off with Gambit revealed not to be harmed. I guess it was a double fake. Okay. Bishop attempts to kill the baby after immobilizing Cable because in the future Bishop comes from, there is something that's known, I think, as the Seven Second Apocalypse, where a redheaded girl suddenly created a fireball that killed an unknowable amount of people, and it caused a new wave of anti-mutant hysteria. It, it made his life utter hell. Oh boy. So Gambit and the Marauders stopped Bishop from killing the baby, with Gambit bringing a section of the ceiling down on Bishop. The Marauders left with the baby, but not before Gambit wonders what exactly could make Bishop turn on the X-Men. They were practically his heroes. Mm -hmm. Uh, The X-Men track Gambit using Cerebro, and they find the Marauders' new hideout on Muir Island. Hmm. You gotta hand it to Sinister, he makes it personal. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Gambit... (laughs) <laughs> what they don't know, though, is that Gambit allowed Cerebro to track into Mir Island. Gambit and Mystique have plans of their own for the mutant infant. Of course. See, this is where it gets weird. Gambit... The, the, this whole thing was a weird triple cross. As the X-Men were closing in on Mir Island, of course, uh, Sinister has this baby. And he has Rogue, who is not feeling very well because she was shot, right? Mm-hmm. So, Mystique puts her hand on the side of Mr. Sinister's head and pushes it down onto Rogue's prone form. Oh, no. It was enough to drain all of the power out of Sinister, killing him. But, of course, Sinister's powers aren't necessarily mutant-born. However, they are extreme genetic control, right? Right. Mm -hmm. This caused Rogue's powers to go a little bit haywire. She started to convulse there. But according to the last page of Destiny's Diaries... Um, Mystique took the baby, this mutant messiah everybody was after, and touched his lips to Rogue's forehead, which somehow righted all of Rogue's biology. She was suddenly feeling a lot better. How the heck? Yeah, that's the thing. Rogue, when she woke up, was upset that her mother used a baby as a weapon, and, you know, also risked this baby's life in saving hers. That's not something Rogue would want. No. The baby... The X-Men finally have the baby, except because Bishop is going out of his mind trying to kill it, Cable grabs it and runs into the future with it, which causes Bishop to chase after it. And we covered that in prior episodes of The Experts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Meanwhile, Rogue doesn't want to deal with Gambit right now because she needs time alone. Gambit betrayed a lot to save her life. Yes, he saved her life, but he went about it in a very circumvental kind of way. Mm -hmm. The baby that everyone was fighting over wasn't seen for another two years in current times. However, that child lived a lifetime in the future, hopping around with Cable. That child is Hope. Yep. So, uh, later on, we have the Divided We Stand storyline. Gambit finds out that the Assassin Guild of New Orleans was uh, hired to kill Charles Xavier. Say what now? Yeah. Yeah, one of the organizations he used to work with is now hired to kill Charles Xavier, and Gambit took it upon himself to save Xavier from danger. Track down Xavier, manages to head off the attackers, even beat some of them before Xavier assisted Gambit in defeating the assassins. So the assassins, I guess, had enough, and they decided to go on to the next item in their kill list, which one of the goons, for some reason, has on them. And this list is full of pie-in-the-sky targets. (laughs) Professor Xavier, Sebastian Mm -hmm. Shaw... Carter Reiking, who's also known as Hazard in the comic books, a childhood friend of Xavier's, and mm-hmm. Kane Marco. Why this select group of people? I don't know. I'm trying to figure out who would send assassins after the Juggernaut. I mean, Xavier reads the list, and he understands why uh, there's a connection between himself and Reiking, but why Shaw? Yeah, no idea. They went to see Hazard, who was in a mental institution at the time, but they found out the night before he arrived, he died of a brain hemorrhage. Hmm. Uh, after, he did. 
Yeah, was I know. that the 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 cause or what that's the, the official cause was. but that sounds like a perfect way to kill somebody when you don't want to when you don't want anyone to know they've been killed here's the thing uh gambit and xavier were headed for a nuclear research facility in alamogordo this is the place where the fathers of charles xavier carter reiking and kane marco all worked at some point in their lives hmm. and uh on the way there, Xavier starts to suffer from headaches, and he and Gambit decide to wait out in the desert for a few hours, where they're attacked again by the Assassin's Guild. Mm-hmm. Uh, Xavier is abducted and taken to the facility, where they find out that the employer of the Assassins was Amanda Mueller. She was the head oh, of a pro- she was the head of a project known as the Black Womb. See, Amanda Mueller was a former lover and protege of one Nathaniel Essex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was also an ancestor of the Summers line. She somehow, she somehow indirectly related, related to the Summers family. Hmm. She wants to use Charles Xavier to activate a, a machine that Sinister left behind called the Cronus machine. See, the idea behind this machine is it's supposed to be able to resurrect uh, Mr. Sinister with his essence power and his, uh, and his memories. While Xavier's undergoing this, Gambit defeats the rest of the assassins on their tail with the help of somebody else who was trying to find out why people were trying to kill him, and his name was Sebastian Shaw. Of course. (laughs) Uh, The two of them team up to destroy the Cronus machine, which threatens Shaw as well as rescue Xavier. Uh, Gambit directly charges Shaw with biokinetic energy, giving him enough power to shatter an indestructible machine, the Cronus machine. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Gambit starts searching Australia for Rogue, and again is hanging around with Professor Xavier. Uh, Gambit's unsure of how this will go, because last time he saw Rogue, as you remember, she requested to be left alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't quite know what to do, because if Rogue didn't want their help or presence, how could you force her? So, they make it over the Australian plains, and they find a very changed land shape, and they think it might be Rogue's doing for some reason. Uh, it's how a... is it Rogue's? Well, it's a mismatched land sh- landscape that appears to be made up of some of Rogue's past memories. Mm, okay. it, inc- it includes a fight she had against Nimrog, being captured and beaten at Genosha. Uh, Gambit has trouble keeping his mind straight watching Rogue in this much pain. But Xavier keeps having to remind Gambit that none of this is exactly real. Uh, while they're running around in the facsimile of Genosha prison cells, Gambit and Xavier find Shyar parts hunters and they're told what finally happened. The person causing these projections is using imprints from Rogue's Danger Room sessions. Oh, boy. And the person causing this is Danger herself. Oh. The sentient AI from the Danger Room. Uh, Xavier figures it's better to find Danger so they can shut down all these weird illusions. And uh, Danger isn't trying to hurt Rogue. Danger is trying to push Rogue to make some kind of odd realization. The Shire Parts Hunters are down there because they're looking for danger. They're looking for technologically advanced parts to sell. Uh, Danger is doing a lot of this subconsciously, though, and the Professor reactivates Danger and she defeats the pirates when they attack Gambit and Xavier. What they discover at this point is that the reason why Danger is pushing Rogue is that Danger has discovered that Rogue's powers never really went past nascent stage. In other words, all this time where Rogue's been unable to touch people and her powers are constantly pulling down energy, her powers really never got past phase one of their evolution. Oh, wow. This is why. Yeah, this is why they never worked properly. This is why she can't control Mm -hmm. them. Gotcha. Makes sense. So this version of Xavier digs into her mind telepathically to finally pull down the mental walls that keep Rogue's powers from her control also manages to remove a couple mental echoes that Mystique accidentally left behind in the forms of trauma. Mm, Yeah, she had a little bit of trauma in her life. So during a period, Rogue was in full control of her own natural abilities. Uh, After this, Rogue and Gambit decide to travel together to San Francisco to Utopia, the small island in the San Francisco Bay that the X-Men are using as a home. They get interrupted by a newer X-Men known as Pixie. The young teleporter that Magic um, traumatized? Unfortunately, San Francisco's in a bit of chaos due to anti-mutant and pro-mutant protests happening at the same time. 
Cyclops sends the three of them to find several missing students and bring them home. And some of the ones they find are Trance, Dragonus, and Toad, all of which are being pursued by Hammer agents. Hammer? Yeah, um, this would be during the Dark Reign period. Also known as the Hammer Time. <laughs> Not quite. Uh, Shield is turned into Hammer. It was a joke. Okay, do you, time. do you remember who runs yeah, Hammer? No, we... What? Do you know who runs Hammer? No. Um, the person I who... to say Osborn? Yeah. Okay. But Osborn doesn't run Hammer at this point. He runs Hammer and the Avengers. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me see. After this, they also managed to find Erg, who is a uh, Morlock, and Avalanche, who's being attacked by a Dark Avenger, the God of War, Ares. Oh. Gambit jumps in the middle of this, and he ends up being pretty much pimp-slapped aside by Ares. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thankfully, more powerful mutants were able to assist, including Danger and Rogue, which leads to Rogue taking off her gloves and absorbing Ares' powers. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Down to the point Ares where... G- a... Sorry? I was going to say, Ares is a mutant? No, he's a god. He's a Greek god. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, something you need to know about Rogue is her powers are a little bit inconsistent when it comes to mythological figures. As Guardians... Yes, sadly. Yeah, as Guardians, she can absorb abilities, but she can... Uh, but for some reason, she can touch as Guardians without forcibly absorbing them. It's more or less a choice to her. However, mm-hmm. characters like Thor are kind of a bottomless well. Loki, his mind is so twisted, she can't really function very well after she grabs his uh, after she grabs his skin. Ares is much more straightforward, and uh, Ar- I, I guess Greek. So I guess it would figure she's able to absorb the uh, powers and make weaker Hercules. So Ares would be under that umbrella as mm-hmm. a Greek figure. Anyway, because of uh, Ares' reduction in powers, one of Gambit's cards is enough to finally put him down for a little while. And uh, they're still looking for another student called Trance, who didn't make it back to base. She appears to be lost and under attack by Miss Marvel from the Dark Adventures. Mm. Uh, this Miss Marvel is Carla Sofen, who's also known as Moonstone. Right. Gambit, Rogue, and Danger manage to take on Miss Marvel, and uh, Rogue calms Trance down. They then th- get back to Utopia. And after the fight between the X-Men and the Dark Avengers is over, Gambit orders... Or I'm sorry, Cyclops orders Gambit to destroy the Omega mach- machine chair that Osborn built to neutralize mutant powers. Huh. Gambit sneaks his way into Hammer headquarters. He fights mutate guards, uh, known as Hijack and Input. Hijack goes down fast, but Input has telepathic abilities that allow him to enter Gambit's mind and discovers that there's still leftover segments of a persona in there known as Death. Mm-hmm. Oh, wonderful. Unfortunately, much like Archangel, this prodding is enough to bring Death to the surface. Uh-oh. Oh, that is wonderful. Oh, it gets even sicker than that. The Death persona uses its own abilities to defeat input and then absorb input into a playing card which turns black. Yikes. What? After this... Uh, Gambit shifts back into his normal form, except he's smiling like a demon. Hmm. Oh, no. Gambit then destroys the chair and returns to the X-Men. Gambit also became angry at Cyclops for letting Rogue go up against M-Plate all by herself. Like, Rogue is not a grown human being. Or Hmm. powerful enough to do something. Right. Um, As he was arguing with Cyclops, he suddenly got these wild mood swings and he left. Gambit changed back into death again, and he remembered that Apocalypse told him he would never be the same after undergoing the process to become a horseman. So, Gambit's powers are suddenly affected by his mood. Uh, After this, in the 2010s, is the Second Coming storyline, where the mutant messiah Hope Summers was returning from the future. Gambit with Dazzler, Anol, Northstar, Cannonball, Pixie, and Trance go to Limbo to rescue another mutant known as Magic. Mm-hmm. Things do not go well. The ground trembles, and an army of demons attack this team. Dazzler asked Gambit for help during the attack, but Gambit, for some reason, sinks into the darkness, claiming, quote, Remy's not home right now. Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. This, unfortunately, allowed the X-Men to be overwhelmed by the demons, and Gambit was once again death. 
Gambit actually, or the Death Persona actually corrupted two of the X-Men, Dazzler and Northstar, into beings like Death. Mm-hmm. Uh, he used his charged cards to corrupt them. So how many times does he actually revert back into the Horsemen? It happened inconsistently. It almost seems like something writers occasionally forget about is a problem with him. Uh, mm-hmm. Believe it or not, this Death version of Gambit was stopped by Ilyana Rasputin and Pixie. See, Magic could not find her soul sword during this period. Mm-hmm. So she convinced Pixie to create a soul dagger out of pieces of her own soul. Hmm. She needed Pixie's help to, re- to uh, find the soul sword. And once they retrieved that, the two of them, with their soul purifying blades, attacked Gambit. Since this attack, I have not seen the death persona reappear. However, mm-hmm. I assume, a lot like Archangel, I don't think it's entirely gone. Yeah. It's never entirely gone. Uh, after this, there was the Curse of the Mutant storyline where Gambit and Storm were sent to find the decapitated body of Dracula for the X-Men to resurrect Dracula. Mm-hmm. They needed him because Dracula's son, Zarius, was creating uh, vampires willy-nilly. They needed somebody more powerful who may have been a bit more subtle than the psychopath. Uh, Gambit is also a regular on the team for a considerable amount of time. He also co-stars with X-23 in her own self-titled series. He saves Laura from a burning building after she's been sent away from after the the uh, the results of the Second Coming event. See, when X-23 was first with the X-Men, she was considered mm, feral. Uh-huh. She tended to cut people for minor irritants. She was not subtle. Nope. <laughs> Uh, after 17 issues together, Gambit and X-23 go different ways, and Gambit decides to stay at the newly built Jean Grey School for Higher Learning, which puts him under Wolverine's umbrella. That feels dangerous. Yeah, a lot. Uh, in 2012, a writer actually had the idea to make Gambit bisexual. Say what? Yeah, he had an idea to make Gambit a bisexual character. Then he got Did word that from, ever get off the ground? No, he got word from editorial that he categorizes it as, quote, word came down that we wouldn't be redefining the character as such, unquote. Meaning... Editorial said no. Okay. Uh, after the Age of X, Gambit chooses not to have his memories of the alternative uh, universe wiped, and he finally admits his feelings to Rogue and tells her that he can't tolerate her indecisiveness. He decides that they should be apart until she's ready to be with him for good. Oh my goodness. And as much as I love them together, they're like, no, we can't be together. And then the other one's like, okay, let's be together. And the other one's like, no, we can't be together. It's like, just get together already, dang it. (laughs) Uh, And when they do, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Gambit then, for some reason, joins the team that includes Rogue, Legion, Magneto, Frenzy, and Xavier. They're looking for Legion's lost personalities that wouldn't cooperate with him after the Age of X storyline. Uh, later on in the series, Gambit, Frenzy, and Rogue travel to the Jean Grey School of Higher Learning to become teachers and mentors. Mm-hmm. That sounds terrific. I mean, what could happen? Gambit's actually listed as a senior staff member. Um, okay, but so is Wolverine. Let's, let's be honest. Which one's scarier? Wolverine? Mm-hmm. That's why he'd make a better teacher? Mm, hey, you throw spitballs. I don't ba- know. You throw spitballs at him and see what happens. I'd be a teacher's pet if Remy LeBeau was my teacher. I don't yeah, think- but you're biased. Yeah. It's something about the accent and the persona. I'm you just also, saying, like, You also don't have a skunk I stripe in your hair. He wouldn't care. I deny that. I I'm can. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say his duster is not part of his persona because it is. <laughs> uh, Gambit was also on an incarnation of X Factor that was a corporate team sponsored by Serval Industries. Hmm. It was led by Polaris. Quicksilver was part of this team. Uh, Kate Pride, who was running the Jean Grey School at the time, sent Gambit and Rogue on an undercover undercover mission to the island of Paraiso. Their mission was as an estranged couple seeking relationship therapy to investigate why mutants are disappearing. This accidentally causes Gambit and Rogue to confront their past emotions and relationship challenges. Uh, What they also find is that their memories and powers are drained into clones of themselves by a mutant called Lavish. While Gambit and Rogue are weak, they do fight against Lavish and the clones, restoring their own memories and powers. And they finally decide to learn from their past mistakes. 
and reunite. I don't know if that's learning from your past mistakes. That, that feels like making your past mistakes over again. It, it seems like making past mistakes in a slightly different way. It almost feels like the title of Gambit and Rogue's relationship could be Make Up Sex. <laughs> yeah, they were good at making up. Uh, the... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there was a conversation with Storm and Nightcrawler that spurs Gambit into proposing to Rogue at Kitty and Colossus's failed wedding. Mm -hmm. And they take advantage of the wedding that didn't happen to have a wedding for themselves. They're actually married by, uh, Kate Pride's rabbi. <laughs> Nightcrawler <laughs> and Iceman were part of Rogue's bridal party, and Storm and X-23 were Gambit's best women. Of course. Uh, Gambit and Rogue go on their honeymoon in space. Of course, because where else would you go? Considering these two? I don't know. But while they're on their honeymoon, they get a message from Kitty Pride, who is still running the Jean Grey school and the X-Men, about some kind of secret package they have to find. The unfortunate... In space? Yes. Wow, the USPS really lost that one. Oh, you have no idea, because they're not the only ones looking <laughs> for it. The Shi'ar Empire wanted. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's not good. Actually, it's better than you think, because they find out the package is alive. Well, that breaks all kinds of international and intergalactic postal code violations. Oh, wait. The package's name is Xandra. Oh. Xandra. It gets better and better. Wait, this is on their honeymoon? Yes. What? Uh, rain on their parade. What's even more is that Xandra herself is very special. Do you know who she is? Yep. Jesse? Xavier's daughter? Xavier and Lalandra's daughter. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She is a princess of the Shi'ar Empire. She also has the ability to take any form at will, and as it turns out, an undiscovered ability until this point is that she is an extreme-level telepath. Yep. Yeah, that was bound to happen, apparently. Uh, while they're trying to figure out what to do with Xandra, they're caught up by the Shi'ar Empire, but fortunately everyone is able to free themselves with a traitor on the Imperial Guard, known as Cerise. Cerise is an alien that can form light constructs. She was actually a member of the second version of Excalibur. She was a, uh, what, she was a fugitive from the Shi'ar Empire. She pretty much got, uh, she escaped a death penalty on a work release program in the Imperial Guard. Technicalities, those, those trust fund babies. Yeah. Um, Xandra read Rogue's mind and uses the time to fix her ability so Rogue can touch anyone. Or she could anyway, but Rogue refuses. And when Gambit asks why, she explains that the last time she happened, she never really learned to control it herself. Hmm. Rogue wants to master her own ability. She doesn't want to be given a shortcut for it. And you've got to respect her for that. I've always That's commendable, her for yeah. That. I do respect her. I just don't respect Gambit. That's my problem. Hey, hey, back off. What? I haven't backed... I technically haven't moved. I'm still standing in the same place. In Titan words, where <laughs> I come from. Well, before they can really dis uh, discuss too far as to uh, what to do in this regard, they're attacked by another member of the Shi'ar Empire. Mm -hmm. This one is known as Deathbird. Yep. Uh, obviously, she wants Xandra because Xandra is the, most, the, the quickest and most direct challenge to Deathbird's claim to the throne. Of course. Uh, Xandra... Like that. <laughs> even though the mutants were losing this fight, Xandra used her abilities to make everyone think she and Rogue were killed, which caused the uh, the Imperial Guard and Deathbird to leave. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, Xandra's shape-changing abilities allowed them to return. The problem was, was that her powers are still a bit wild. In faking Rogue's death, she also caused Rogue's powers to go... exponential. Of course. No, Rogue can now absorb memories, life force, and mutant energies without touching anyone. She now has an area of effect that she cannot control. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I remember that jump from tactile to... Yeah. Xandra tells Rogue that her powers have uh, evolved, so for the first time, they've passed that nascent stage. But uh, Rogue's going to have to learn to control it on her own. Who oh boy. Yeah. Uh, Gambit and Rogue, after this, decide to return to Earth. Unfortunately, on their way to Earth, they're intercepted by somebody who's looking for entertainment. Oh, Ojo. Yeah. Yeah, he transports him directly to the Mojoverse. They can't just, like, have a nice romantic getaway. Oh, they could. I mean, he transported them into a show where they both believe they're part of the noir setting. Old-fashioned gumshoe mysteries. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> the pro- I remember just a snippet of this um, storyline, just a itty bitty snippet, but I do remember that setting. Yeah, it, it started to become kind of tricky because in the middle of this noir setting, Rogue's memory started to kick in. And as soon as she remembered who she was, her powers kicked on and she accidentally killed Gambit. He was in her area of, of it. yeah, he was in her area of effect. Oh no! This irritated Mojo, so he reset the scenario. He resurrected Gambit, wiped Rogue's memories again, and he put them in a fantasy world. Unfortunately, while they're arguing with each other, Rogue's memories start to kick in. She created an area of effect and killed Gambit. Oh boy! How many times did she kill this man? Well, let's see. They were put in a noir world, a fantasy world, a western world, a horror world, a romance world, a sci-fi world, and a comedy and a reality talk show. I'm sensing a theme. Anyway, um, somehow during the reality talk show, before Rogue's memories come back, Gambit gets irritated and walks away. He goes to a bar, and he meets a woman who starts talking him up. Something about trying to fix his life and fix his girlfriend's powers. That gets his attention. The girl in question is Spiral. <laughs> How much do you know about Spiral. Not much. Just Surface really level. the name. Yeah. Okay. You're going to have to follow me on this. Okay. So Spiral is one of um, Mojo's chief lieutenants. Right. A six-armed woman who can create dimensional portals. She can walk between the Mojoverse and any other dimension she needs to get to, including the 616. Colloquial, normal, Marvel, Earth. Right? Right. Uh, mm-hmm. She's a master of combat. She can put a weapon in each hand and fight. Uh, she's been depicted yes. in a couple Marvel video games. And... Even though her look is somewhat weirdly ridiculous, she looks like 80s glam cross with, like, 80s knowledge of samurai movies. That is a, that is a succinct way to describe her look in very simple terms. Think a mm, lot yes. of teal blue. Yep. Anyway, one of the first times we see her is in the Longshot miniseries. This is technically the character's first appearance. And uh, she was consistently harassing Longshot while he was trying to run away from the Mojo and the Mojoverse, as well as Gog and Magog. Mm-hmm. And uh, she kept encountering Longshot and his new friend, a young lady named Ricochet Rita, who is a stunt woman. Yeah. She's working on sets. Now, Ricochet Rita is eventually drawn by Long... or taken with Longshot back to the Mojoverse, because Longshot figures out he's a freedom fighter, he wants to fight, Rita's in love with him, she follows him. A, a very natural thing. Mm-hmm. At least as far as storytelling goes. Um, anyway, Rita disappears for a while. What we discover in subsequent volumes of X-Books, especially in Excalibur, if I remember correctly, is that Spiral is Ricochet Rita. What? Because of dimensional travel and the wacky timeline of the Mojoverse, which isn't as linear as it would be on most other planes. Sure. Rita is the thing that Spiral's created out of. Mojo, oh. essentially, because of her early adventures in the Mojoverse, Longshot and she are separated. Mojo grabs her, grafts on extra arms, cha- uh, messes with her mind, and creates Spiral. Wow. Which explains, like, it's all timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly, which is why Spiral has met Ricochet Rita, even though the two of them are the same thing. Bizarre. It is. Except, at this point, Spiral has for a short time, been a member of X-Force, and she is tired of Mojo and his constant whining about ratings, which is why she's willing to help Gambit rescue Rogue in exchange for getting her the frick out of here. Mm -hmm. And if Gambit will steal something. And let me guess what that is. What do you think it is? A shiny thing? Generally, yeah. (laughs) Uh, needless to say, is... the storyline eventually okay. goes their way, and Spiral helps them get away, and Spiral goes her own direction. Goodness knows where she is now. I haven't seen her since. And this is where we hmm. catch up to the current era. Mr. and Mrs. X, the series where the last couple storylines we talked about was ended in favor of Dawn of X, and we know where the story mm-hmm. goes from there. And we also know what Gambit's position is. He's a member of Excalibur, although he is the person that is there out of circumstance, not because he was picked for anything in particular. It's true. He's there because Apocalypse needed Rogue. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also know that as a result of Excalibur, Rogue's powers are fixed, so they can finally have a physical relationship, even though Rogue is very trepidatious about ever having a baby. All right. And I understand her concern. We don't know what her biology and her powers would do to something growing inside of her. Uh, or the thing growing inside of her would do to her. 
Well, that's, a th that's another curiosity, because there have been several storylines of possible futures of the X-Men that have involved a child generally known to be Gambit and Rogue's child. Mm -hmm. Usually a girl, I find. Yeah, most of the time. So, I mean, they're their relationship could create a heck of a child, except Rogue is It'd always be terrifying the terrifying too. Yeah, Rogue is always the wild card in that though. Uh huh. I mean, if you get, if you use it as a simple matter of what would their abilities combined make, I mean, it almost sounds like somebody who would keep pulling the energy from their own charged cards. Mm, maybe. I don't know. Mutants can be such a wild crapshoot when it comes to what what their children can create. And then usually the powers of the children, as far as the X-Men go, don't always follow a logical um, sequence. They more or less do, but there's always that bit of randomness in it. I mean, yeah. um, Chimera the comes... writers are just like, I'm yeah. just going to throw this in there. I mean, Chimera comes from a future where Storm and the Black Panther had a child, which is fine, but her abilities always seem more wild and she doesn't rely on them, so it's hard to tell what what they do. Um, when you think about the possible future where Bishop comes from, there's Ruby Summers. Right. A, a child supposedly of Cyclops and Emma Frost, which is somebody whose default form is like living Ruby Quartz, like Emma Frost Diamond formed all the time, and she can fire the occasional eye beam. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's Shatterstar, who is the child of Longshot and Dazzler. Oh, that's right. Whose abilities right. are completely off the wall compared to the two of them. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's Cable, you know, who is uh, Jean Grey, under parentheses, Madeline Pryor's child with Cyclops, who pretty much has nothing of Cyclops' abilities. It's it's like Jean Grey turned up times two. Right. You know, assuming his powers work like they're supposed to, which they don't always do. Don't always, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, of course, you go the alternative route. Uh, Jean Grey and Cyclops' actual child, Rachel. Yeah, Rachel. <laughs> and then, how does... Uh, hope, hope falls into that. Hope is not a Summers. Hope is right. Well, mm -hmm. she's a Summers by adoption. She adoption, right? Her birth was completely random. She is a mutant, but we don't know who her parents were because they apparent they evidently died in the hospital. And her oh, abilities, yeah. <laughs> her essential ability <laughs> is power copying. Mm -hmm. Any mutant in her area, she can one hundred percent replicate their abilities at their strongest. Which is a very good ability, except we don't know who her parents are, or if one of them was ever a mutant. Hmm. It is possible for two normal human people to have a mutant child. Right. So, I can't well, power say... Sounds... Hope's power sounds drastically similar to Mimic. Mm -hmm. It does, but Mimic has always had a problem with relationships, because he's always had mental difficulties. And Mimic has appeared since Hope has. Okay. Mimic's never evidently had a child. There's also the idea, or the notion that you have to get over, that Mimic is not a mutant. Yeah, he's not. You know, he's Does it mean that he couldn't have a mutant child, though? Not potentially. I mean, Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Woman had a mutant. And his powers are nothing like either of them. Well, their powers are infused from other means not natural. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I would say so. They were, like, a forced mutation. Yeah, so... We got way off track there. Yeah. But uh, th that's everything we know about Gambit. How much have you learned in all of this? I'm learning that Gambit is a very, very possessive person. <laughs> <laughs> he probably well, does free... Say devoted. I No, possessive. I think he has I bought a so. lot of edible arrangements in his lifetime. <laughs> Mind um, you, I was a person probably. that liked Gambit growing up because he was the cool guy, but he's very possessive. I, I grew up liking Gambit because of his style, his attitude, and of course Rogue and well, Rogue and Storm are my two favorite X-Men, so of course I have always shipped him and Rogue. Um, nobody's perfect. <laughs> uh huh. And no relationship is perfect, especially in the X-Men universe. Uh -huh. There's a lot of complication. Mm -hmm. But they are one of the best, most functional couples. And that's saying a lot in the in the Marvel world, okay? Especially in the X-Men. They actually function. 
and once they smooth out the oh no we can't be together or I'm afraid of being together once they smooth that out hey they got some traction I I still don't see them as functional only because Gambit keeps trying to play the white knight except Rogue is her own knight she, I know, she doesn't need a knight. She's a strong, independent woman who don't need no man, but it's nice to have one, right? So... Karma would argue otherwise. I like his heart. <laughs> I like his heart. I like his motivations, and I really like him and Rogue together. And I will never stop liking them together, so... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, fight me. <laughs> Let's go. I got my monster. Let's go. Not my deal. I, I admit, growing up, I liked him for about six months, but after, even as a kid, I looked at this character after a while and just thought, this is somebody's attempt at making something cool, and I'm already bored. And I just Maybe nostalgia plays in a little bit strongly with my opinions, but still. Eh. Still. But, you know, I just... It was always a character that required more story. It... Whoever was filling in the blanks, I just never felt like they had an entire story. The the later add-ons of the uh, the uh, the mutant massacre, and then the add-on of death. It always felt like somebody was trying to create something out of it. Yeah, that's. I mm-hmm. mean, I understand that. You know, I I I have a lot of mutants I like. It's, there are some that irritate the the just the ever living heck out of me. Wolverine, Beast, and Gambit are on that list. And I like Beast, but Beast just he leaps before he looks, which is almost funny considering how much he jumps around. But uh now, it seems yeah. like Gambit's niche of being the thief is just that and that's all you really he really needs to be. I almost feel like Gambit's niche isn't being the thief, it's stirring the pot. He almost seems to cause more trouble that other people have to undo. No, he's not Cyclops. No, Cyclops is the one you ask to handle the pot, or at least blow it up. He definitely makes things messy. Messier. Cyclops does, not not Gambit. I would say not. As far as missions, Cyclops does well. It's just, Cyclops has never been very good at managing his personal life. But that's what happens when you're a pseudo-professional soldier, unfortunately. (laughs) Who are we to judge? Are, Are our personal lives perfect? No. Not in the slightest. I never push away my wife just because uh, she, I thought she didn't need me. On one hand, I, I think we're getting a bit personal here. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna walk the other way here. Um, <laughs> so I'm saying personal lives are messy. Things don't always go the way you want them to. I still like that he and Rogue made it work after everything. Well, they seem pretty dang happy on Krakoa. For now, they have. We'll see what happens. If there's one thing mutant, or if there's one thing comic book couples do, it's divorce. Look, I'm still not over T'Challa and Aurora's divorce. Okay. I wish I could I call thought... it a divorce. He annulled it. That was wicked. Well, yeah, I'm not okay with that, and I'm probably not going to forgive him for a while. I think that they would have been an amazing power couple had they. <sighs> okay, and their kids. Thundercats. I'm calling it now. No! Yes! Storm and T'Challa's kids are Thundercats. That's only if all of them become Black Panther, which is impossible. Who knows? <laughs> it really Say. isn't. Ask Shuri. Thundercats. Uh, any idea which X-Men to discuss next week? Oh, I um... thought as we were discussing this. There is a lot of... Oh, I got one that's going to be way off the sidetracks here. And their history is probably going to be very dull by comparison. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the one I was thinking about was actually a major X-Men that that most people know. Oh. I think it was tossed between Magneto or Xavier. That would take a long time. They've been around since the 60s. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I was actually going to go the other way, to a non-combatant. Or at least they used to be. Who? Douglas Ramsey. Really? Hmm. Cypher. Yeah. Yeah. How much do people know about him other than he died for a significant amount of time? Mm. That's what I mean. That's fair. 
You know, besides which, if he's going to be the guy talking to their island all the time, you got to find out who he is. That's that's a good that's a good pick. <laughs> all right, next week we will discuss Cipher. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you feel like you learned something, uh, and I hope you stay safe. Have a great one. I am Jeremy. I'm Joanna. And I am Jesse. And you have just been expertly informed. This podcast is part of the Second Union Podcast Network. You can listen, like, and subscribe to all our podcasts by heading over to wearesecondunion.com. Thank you for listening.